March, I discovered real estate and I, I saw this YouTube commercial. I was like, whoa, what is this? You know, you can make money without pouring any money into real estate. Are you, are you serious? And I saw that and I was like, man, this is a perfect opportunity for me. Welcome to the Seven Figure Flipping Podcast, where we take you behind the scenes of wholesaling and house flipping businesses. The systems and automation that we discuss will help you build a real business instead of another job for yourself. From beginners to those doing hundreds of thousands a year, we go deep into the details and strategies that are working today. And now your host, Bill Allen. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Seven Figure Flipping Podcast. This is Bill Allen. And today I've got a really cool treat for you guys. Um, and we just got back from Flip Hacking Live 2019. So we're about, uh, I don't know, two weeks uh, out of that event. And what we did for the first time, we asked for some feedback on the event. So we sent out a survey. We asked for uh, all the people that attended the event to give us some feedback. We asked them a couple of questions like, what presentation did you like the most? Um, which, what would you like to have seen more of? How was the event? How was the hotel? How were all the amenities? Those kind of things. Just so we can make this event better than ever next year. I wanted to get feedback from everybody that attended. So what we did was we ran a little contest. We said, um, it, for anybody that sends us a survey form, what we'll do is we'll put you in a hat and we'll kind of pull out a, a winner to get on an hour-long coaching call with me. And that motivated a lot of people to submit their surveys. So we got a ton of feedback on the event, which is incredible. If you said, submitted a survey, I just want to say thank you so much. It's going to make us better than ever. Walter Bond at that event talked about watching game film constantly watching game film, getting better, listening to your appointments, listen to your, um, listen to your phone calls, figure out how to get better, watch game film, the pros watch game film. So I want to make sure that Flip Hacking Live 2020 is as best as event ever, 10 times better than this year, if that's even possible, just figuring out how to get better at what we do. And the feedback from you guys is all helping. I've read every single one of them. It took me almost the whole day to do, but there's a ton of takeaways in there. Some really great stuff that you guys gave. So if you submitted a survey, I just want to say thank you so much. Well, Dante Brown is in Sacramento, California. He is the one who we picked out of a hat and he got the opportunity to get on a coaching call with me for an hour. And he's a new wholesaler. He's in Sacramento. He's done one deal. It's a really cool, uh, just coming off this, this uh, interview right now, this kind of coaching call. And so what I asked him was, would you mind if we put it on the podcast? Because I think this is something that we don't usually do. We don't usually talk to people who are newer in the business, who are just getting started. Usually it's somebody who's growing or scaling their business. It's one of our seven figure uh, altitude members. It's one of our, um, our kind of bigger businesses doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. It's not necessarily somebody who's just getting started. So this is a totally different perspective. This is an also a behind the scenes things, uh, behind the scenes conversation with me and him on his business. He had no problem sharing it. He was really excited about it. So, um, I think it's going to be really cool and I hope you guys get a lot out of it. I think that even newer people and more advanced people are both going to get something out of this, this, uh, this call that I did with Dante. And this is a young man. He's 22 years old. He is going places. There is no doubt in my mind that this guy is going somewhere big. And I'm really excited to kind of follow his journey over the next year and see him at Flip Hacking Live next year. And he's even got a surprise announcement at the end of this podcast that I want you guys to hear. So, um, it's really, it was really fun. I had a great time. He reminds me a lot of my cousin, Joey, which you'll hear us talk about that at the end, who is also at Flip Hacking Live. Some of you may have met my cousin, Joey, and his mom, Irene, is my dad's sister and, uh, and my cousin. So um, without further ado, I want to bring you guys Dante. And one more thing, one more reminder, guys. Our seven figure runway program, this new mastermind group that we created is we're closing the doors for one year until Flip Hacking Live 2020. Um, on Thursday night, October 24th at midnight. So if you're not in by then, that's the last chance. So if you want to check it out, go to sevenfigurerunway.com and you can check out what we're doing. So I'm going to bring on Dante. This is just, this is a behind the scenes kind of coaching call. He won this, uh, he won this call based on the survey that he submitted and being, you know, one of hundreds that we pulled out of a hat to, uh, to win uh, just an interview with me. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear it and be kind of a fly on the wall with him and his business. So here's uh, Dante and my at a coaching call. Okay. So we did this. Um, um, so we did this kind of like survey for flip hacking live. So uh, Dante, you went to flip hacking live, right? Yes, I did. Okay. So we, we did the survey at the end of the event. We had about 600, 625 people there, something like that. And then, uh, we did the survey at the end where it was, um, 
what did you think about the event? Give us some feedback. And we did this kind of contest of, uh, you know, everybody that submits a survey will pull one from the hat and uh, we'll do a coaching call with them for like an hour. So um, you won the uh, kind of survey response coaching call. And um, so we'll kind of just take some time, take an hour and ask me anything that you want. So um, why don't just tell me a little bit about yourself first so I can kind of get to know where you are in wholesaling, um, where you are in, in the country and like how old you are stuff. Just t- give me a little background on you. All right. I'll, I'll give you a background. Um, I would say what's the date? It's October. Um, say 10 months ago, I had no clue what I was going to do. Um, I had, I'm not going to say I wasn't interested in real estate, but I wasn't even thinking about anything about joining real estate. Um, I just finished my last football season. Things didn't go well. Um, I was the hardest worker on the team, but I just didn't seem, I mean, I I kind of found um, what it was like to be in a situation where you have someone who has control over you where you just sometimes you can't do anything about it and so that that's when I started to think afterwards I was like hey I was the hardest worker I put in all the work things didn't turn out this way because I had someone telling me that I couldn't do something and I started thinking hey I want to be on entrepreneur because I don't want to go like that in the workforce like when I end up having to go in the workforce and work for a work for a job or a company I don't want to have to I'm not going to say take orders from other people but be in a position where I can't control my destiny and so um you know I, I've worked at BJ's as well um afterwards after that football season and even working there I was just like I mean I was just trapped in this I guess just working this little little job and uh, at the same time I, I discovered real estate and that was uh, in March. March I discovered real estate and I, I saw this uh, this YouTube um, little commercial um, from, from Max Maxwell and I was like whoa what is this you know you can make money without pouring any money into real estate are you, are you serious? And I saw that and I was like, man, this is a perfect opportunity for me. I have the work ethic. If I just apply the same work ethic that I had with football into something else, I know I can bear the fruit and I know I can get results. And so um, I, now, now I was diving in and I got kind of got analysis paralysis, you okay. know, when you first start in and I started driving around, getting to know the neighborhood. I was actually driving for another investor at first and I didn't see any results with that. And just kept on learning, working at BJ's. And then at some point, I was just like, because well, I was still going to college. I didn't, I didn't mention that. I was still going to college at the, at the same time. And um, I just decided, you know, I kind of want to just pursue real estate. Like, I, I don't even, at this point, I didn't see any, any point of me continuing college. I, I didn't see how it was going to help me really with real estate and where I want to go. Because I know at this point, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. And I just want to control my own destiny. I want to control my own business. And I'm a real believer in you can do whatever you want. You know, you can really achieve whatever you want, especially in this country. This is a beautiful country where everyone has an opportunity to do what they want, you know. And so um, I'm over here. I get introduced to cold calling. And that's how I'm starting to drive my business. And I would say, I really started taking action, I would say May, taking a little bit of action, you know, starting to amp it up, starting to cold call, dialing, because I didn't have the money to to pay for a dialer. And then I ended up getting my first deal the week before Flip Hacking Live. Awesome. Okay, so let me back up a little bit. So when you say your last football season, you're talking about at high school, in high school? Oh, no, no, in, uh, in college. Okay, in college. So how old are you? I'm at junior college. I'm 22. 22 years old. Okay, cool. So yeah. you're, I was like, oh my gosh, are you like 19 years old? Okay, so 22, <laughs> 22 years old, working at BJ's, you stumbled across uh, Max and YouTube and stuff like that and then started, yeah. started digging into it a little bit more, just kind of researching it, getting into analysis paralysis, like you said, started cold calling. Yeah. And then how did you find out about Flip Hacking Live? Um, I actually got a ringless voicemail from you guys. Um, oh, really? Um, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot who I had talked to, but he, I saw a ringless voicemail. I was driving for dollars at the time, looking for properties over in a rough neighborhood in South Sacramento. And I saw the ringless voicemail. Uh, or I saw the voicemail 
heard it and I was like, yo, this sounds like a perfect opportunity. I mean, I, I really didn't even have the money at the time. Um, but you know, I got it done. I was still working at BJ's, um, pay for the ticket. And then, so, so that's how I heard about you guys. That's awesome. And so it's, it's kind just, of funny, isn't it? Like, we, so in yeah. my mind, when I, when I, I took over the company about, uh, I don't know, three months ago now. So when I, when I said, we've got to figure out how to get Flip Hacking Live in front of more people, I said, well, what do we do in our real estate business? Like we send direct mail, we do ringless voicemails, we cold call, we, we, uh, we text, we just text blast. So we just started hitting using all of the techniques that we use in our real estate business because that's what I know. So yeah. anybody in our database, anybody who we could find phone numbers for, stuff like that, we were just dropping ringless voicemails and texting and stuff and just seeing who would get there. So that's cool. I'm glad... You're, I think you might be the first person that I know that got to bring this voicemail and bought a ticket. So at least I know, I can tell my team now that it's working. There's people out there that, um, that got the ringless voicemail and you didn't know who we were, we were at the time at all. No, I, I didn't. Um, I just saw this as a great opportunity though, to, to meet nice. other high class investors, you know, who are, who have done the same thing that I'm doing starting out and because everyone starts out at, yeah. at a certain point at the beginning level. So, I knew it was a great opportunity. Cool. So did, did you come to go down there by yourself or did somebody else come with you or? Um, yeah. So I went down there with my mom, actually. My mom actually took me out there. I got the ticket and she said that um, she'd actually like to go on a vacation to San Diego. Nice. And so me personally, I had to take the bus there. Um, I wasn't going to take a flight, but I was like, you know, what? I'll save some money. I'm, I'm cheap. Yeah. And so um, save some money took a bus out there. My mom met me out there. We stayed at a hotel right by actually. Okay. Um, and yeah, so she was out there with me, her and my little sister, they were just taking a vacation, but basically I was there yeah, by myself as far as at the actual event. Cool. That's awesome. It's nice. So, okay. You went to the event, you spent three days. So you got a deal the week before. How'd you get that deal? What was it like? And yeah, Tell me, tell me a little bit about that deal. So is it, was it a wholesale deal? What did it, yeah. what did it look like? This was a wholesale deal. Um, I made three grand off of it. Um, I, I actually, what's crazy is I got this from a co-violation list. Um, I saw that on the county, um, I think another wholesaler told me that you can get co-violations on the county website. And I did not know that. I was like, what, are you serious? Like this free information, just all these co-violations. And then so I saw all these vacant properties I just started calling all them. I was like, oh, this is a wonderful opportunity. And I started calling and I got this property that was, it said it was vacant. It was all boarded up. It was in uh, Del Paso, very ghetto neighborhood. Um, and I called the ex-wife of Brett. He's the seller. Um, I called her. She said, hey, I'm not living there, but Brett, he's, he's there right now. Um, I'm not sure if he's interested. So she gave me his number, called him. He said, what's your offer? I was like, you know, uh, it, it, the price that we can give depends on the condition of the property. Yeah. So nice. I started to, you know, get him to open up about it. And then we met there and we met at the property and I saw that the property was just in really rough shape. Um, it wasn't what he had previously told me. He told me it was probably like, you know, 10, 20,000 repairs. It was probably about 70 grand in repairs. I mean, mm. you know, everything needed to be done. Needed the HVAC, needed a roof, needed everything, new flooring, new kitchen. Maybe didn't need new cabinets, cabinets, which was good. Um, That's pretty typical. That, the sellers always say it's about like, I don't know, 40, 30, 40% less than, or, or even more. Like, you know, oh yeah, it only needs 10 or 15,000. It needs 50 or 60 or 80, you know? So yeah, pretty typical. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I went to the property and I saw, you know, I was like, Hey, you know, you want 115 and he wasn't, or no, he wanted 120 basically. Cause he said he wants 40,000 for it. And he owed 180,000 or no, he owed 80,000 on it. He wanted 120 basically cause he wanted 40,000. And I was just like, Hey, you know, we're not going to be able to do this. Um, and I just told him straight up and he was like, you know, it, it, it's okay. And I was like, you know, uh, is there any other price in mind that you, that you have that, that, you know, that we can do and, and you'd feel comfortable with? And he was just basically like, no, he wasn't negotiable about it. So I was like, okay. And then, so we split, split ways that day. And what's crazy is another investor that I sent this property to, he was like, Hey, how did it go? And I was like, I don't know, man, I think there's just 
too many repairs needed. I, I just don't see how this is a deal. In my eyes, I wouldn't have bought the property. Mm -hmm. But the other investor was like, hey, you know, I sent him the pictures. He's like, hey, we can actually do this at one fifth or one eighteen. And I was like, what? All right, sign me up. Let me go back to him. So I called Brett and I told him, I said, hey, we can do one fifteen. And he thought I said one fifty. And so he's like, are you sure? <laughs> and uh, so I go to the property. I was like, yeah, we could do 115. And he was like, oh, I thought you said 150. I was like, no, 115. I could and actually then, pay you 30,000 more than you're asking for. How does that sound? Yeah. Oh, that yeah. sounds great. Come over. How fast can you get here? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then he also had another investor who was looking at the property and interested. But, you know, I just developed rapport with him. And uh, I had my buyer actually come on the appointment, the second appointment with me. Um, cause I knew we were going to get this done and we got it done and yeah. Uh, what was it? Three and a half weeks later I get paid. It, it was a bunch of, I mean, he, so the deal with the seller is he was actually on H he was on heroin. Yeah. So he's, he was a drug addict, drug addict. And you know, after we signed the contract and everything, he was going crazy on me. I mean, he was calling me. He said I should never be in sales, to, saying all this stuff. I really don't know what the problem was, but we ended up getting it done. Uh, yeah, just made an extra three grand. So nice. Well, hopefully, after coming to Flip Hacking Live, you would have been able to negotiate that property down to one ten next time, so you can make yeah. eight instead of three, right? So exactly. Hey, you know, exactly. when I was preparing for this uh, th this um, call with you, um, I I jumped on your Facebook page. I did some searching and stuff. I was just kind of wanted to see who you were and stuff like that. So okay. uh, don't be surprised. But I found this picture in um, with a bunch of books. Uh, you're in like front of a ton of books, and I'll tell you what. Uh -oh. This this picture is why I'm telling you right now, this is why you're successful. It's you've got books up there like uh, never split the difference by Chris Voss. It looks like the 10 X. I can only see part of it. It looks like the 10 X rule. You got a book up there uh -huh. by Brian Tracy, uh, the millionaire next door. That is like the number one book that I recommend to young people who mm -hmm. want to figure out how to become millionaires. The millionaire next door is one of my favorite books. It's like the first book that yeah. I recommend to people on money management and mindset of money and the millionaire mindset. And then mm -hmm. I see uh, Dean Graziosi's book up on the top shelf there. Yeah. Uh, so really cool stuff that, um, I, and I, I think I can tell what some of the other ones are. Um, uh, but it's, you've got a stack of some incredible, like those are incredible coaches that you have right there next to you. So yeah. I mean, if you read that book, never split the difference like three or four more times, you'll get that guy down to a hundred thousand next time. So just sitting there, <laughs> sitting there mirroring and labeling them nonstop and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, and finding the black mm -hmm. swan. So, um, that, but there's some phenomenal stuff there. And I'll tell you that that's really cool when I found that and I knew that I was going to be spending some time with you. So, so let's mm -hmm. move it. So you're in Sacramento, you've done one deal, you're just getting started in wholesaling and we don't have a lot of people on this, uh, like, like that I talk to a lot of times that we interview that are kind of new. So what we're going to do is let's just like, ask me anything. I don't care. Um, you, you were at Flip Hacking Live. So you kind of know what my business looks like, who's in the company. Yeah. Uh, the structure and all that stuff. But I was right where you are too. I remember when I was getting started and I was first doing deals, I was a little bit unsure, right? I didn't have a lot of confidence. So I would do the same thing. I would send that deal to another investor before I had it under contract and say, Hey, can you look at this? Can you, yeah. um, can you analyze this for me? Um, what do you think about the repairs? Because I'm not really sure. And I'll tell you one thing that I teach right now to those, those experienced flippers who are on the other side that are receiving emails like yours is to Ooh. find people like you to, to build rapport with and help because that's the kind of, you're going to give them that deal for a $3,000 assignment fee where exactly. the company might, might give, uh, give them the deal for a $15,000 assignment fee. Exactly. So they can exactly. find and help you, but eventually you're going to start outgrowing them, right? You're going to start understanding the business. You're going to start building your buyer's list. You're going to get more confidence and then you're going to be exactly. able to go out there and use all the tips and, and techniques that kind of we teach. So, um, mm -hmm. really cool stuff to see kind of both sides of it. So this is a, this is a great, opportunity for me too to get to know you and, and some of the, the things that you need and like what the needs are of some of the the newer folks that are just getting going mm -hmm. in business. So um, ask me anything. I'm an open book. I'm happy to share okay. like anything from my company, anything that you need. Uh, you saw at Flip Hacking Live, we're very kind of open with what we do. So uh, what okay. do you got for me? Yeah, well, um, I knew going into this call, I knew you weren't much of a cold calling guy. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I, I do everything cold calling right now. Um, I don't want to spend any money on 
like really my marketing is really not much. I've just been using property radar, um, pulling off lists from there and then using the county website. And then I had like three months in a row where I was just driving for dollars like tremendously. And I have a bunch of leads from that. And so I'm still pulling through those. But uh, let's say, you know, you were in my position, you just got your first deal and, you know, you basically have all day to, to pursue real estate. Um, but like, what would you do at that point after getting your first deal and, you know, managing your time in, like, what would you do with your business at, at that point? After So, so you've got $3,000 that came in, right? Are all yeah. your, uh, all your expenses, living expenses covered by everything else that you do, jobs, stuff like that. Like you don't need that money. You're going to reinvest back in the business, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I would do then is I would say if everything you've done up to this point is free or very low cost, I would take that $3,000 and say, I want to reinvest this back into my business and I would create a runway with that $3,000. So I would, I would say, I want to use this for about, I like a six month path, but you can create a path because a lot of times what happens with wholesalers is they get their first deal somewhat quickly. You, you didn't, I mean, May, May to yeah. October, you were working for a while doing so, it right yeah, drive for dollars. Exactly. Yeah. And me too. So we, we, I deal with some people who get their first deal in like two, two weeks. And then next thing you know, it's like four months before their next one. So you got to yeah. really make sure that you don't spend all that just on uh, un, unnecessary things, frivolous needs, things like that. So right yeah. now you're doing exactly what you should be doing. You're not setting up these expansive LLCs, business cards, websites, all that stuff. You're focusing on the fact that you have some time and you don't have a lot of money. So I would stay yeah. in that mindset a little bit and not say I'm rich. I got $3,000. I'm going to go spend it on one month doing direct mail. But rather yeah. what I would do is I would space it out over at least three months in an ideal world, six months. So if you give yourself $500 a month and say, look what I did with no money, what could I do with $500? So, and then be very smart about where you spend it. So you want to invest it in something in the business. I don't think you need a big fancy CRM. I don't think you need a big fancy dialer, another cold caller, things like that. So I would stay in the niche that you're doing, pull the niche list. A lot of the stuff you heard from Ryan Smith at the yeah. I would just open your notebook to that and like look at all those niche type stuff and say, okay, now I can build a, a bigger list. And maybe what you do is you start looking into uh, maybe some ringless voicemails or something that's not a high cost because I, the way that I look at cost is really like networking is free, right? So all the stuff like driving for dollars, knocking on doors, it's gas money and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. You're, you continue to do that stuff. And then what you do with those lists are important. So if you're going to skip trace those lists, that's going to be a little cost for the skip tracing. And then figure yeah. out the, what's the next cheapest thing that you can do to scale up a little bit. And ringless voicemail might be it. I know there's some, I'm just going to put a disclaimer. There's some like legalities and stuff in different states and cities with ringless yeah. voicemail. So you just have to be careful with how you do it. But that might be your next step to, to get some people now to start calling you back and, and bringing some inbound mm -hmm. leads and continue to do that. Cause the cold calling for the scalability of it for one person, it, it it's, if you, if that's where you want to go, you're going to need a big list to get on a dialer and dial like three lines at a time. You can do that yourself. And it's not that expensive. Yeah. That's a, probably about a yeah. hundred bucks a month to get a mm -hmm. dialer. So you could get, um, you could get a, a better dialer and do some cold calling with some of that. And then the other side of it, you could drop some ringless voicemails with some of that money. Um, okay. that's what I would okay. do. I would set, I would set aside about 500 bucks. I give me six months. And then what happens is the next deal comes. And when the next mm -hmm. deal comes, maybe the next deal is 6,000 or 8,000 or 10,000. And now mm -hmm. you can start saying what, what I like to do is just master one marketing channel and then move on to the next one. Don't go do 10 different things. So yeah. the, the cold calling and, and ringless voicemail kind of go hand in hand. It's your skip tracing, you're getting the phone numbers and then you're doing something with it. So, yeah. um, so I would say those probably go pretty well together, but I wouldn't go do like, Hey, I got my second deal. I made $8,000. I'm going to go do pay-per-click and direct mail and ring this voicemail and cold calling. So yeah. when I grew, I just, I, I was the direct mail guy. I just got really good at pulling my lists, sent mail. And that's how I grew my business. And it's still about 75% of what we do comes from that channel. And mm. 
but it's really expensive. I spend like $35,000 a month on direct mail. Mm -hmm. So you now in the, in the marketplace that we're in, I've gotten to a point where my business is big, it's scaled up and I can do that. If I was going into the marketplace right now, if I was doing direct mail, it would be really, really, really targeted with like niche lists or very specific areas that I would own the area. So, Mm -hmm. so that's my recommendation is you, you take some of that money and you put it back into the business and you figure out now your focus is getting the next deal. Not going to mm-hmm. like build a team, get three, four more deals. Just your next target is the next deal. And what you want to do is you want to start shrinking that timeline of how long it takes to get the second deal and then shrink mm-hmm. the timeline for the third deal and then shrink the timeline for the fourth deal and so on. And then you'll start seeing you get one deal a month, maybe two deals a month, and then you can start growing with the money that's coming in. So okay. don't go buy a Ferrari. Okay. definitely not definitely not um yeah as far as a dialer i just actually got a new dialer um are you familiar with the red x storm dialer yep yep i am actually yeah so i got our members are using that yeah i'm using that um well not using it yet i'm still putting all my leads inside it from property radar it's a hassle but once i get that done it's like i can just you know really call as many people as i want but for now since i'm still I'm still dialing. Um, I'm still targeting the, those niche lists, which right now co-violation is giving me a good response. And for some reason, I really have not hit on my driving for a dollar. I've been on a few po- appointments, but uh, they just want too much money. Um, but you're making but contact eventually. with those people. You're getting contact yeah, with I'm them. Making, That's good. Yeah, I'm getting contact with them. But so remember, just, when you're tracking when you're tracking those numbers. You want to see like what is the data good? Like where are the weak spots? So if the data is good, you're getting in contact with them. You're going on the appointments. They want too much money. Then take it into a feedback loop and say why. Like why do they want too much money? Like am I not targeting the right areas? Maybe I'm not driving around the right neighborhoods. And so because like if I went out here in Nashville and drove through Brentwood and wrote down the addresses of houses that looked a little bit beat up. Um, and I called them, they're going to want retail price. These are retail sellers that they're, they're Brentwood in Nashville is like the Beverly Hills of, of California. It's really mm. where, where the, um, the guys from the Titans live, the predators live, all the country music stars, yeah. it's the really rich place. But then if I go to the area where it's more blue collar, it's more rundown that people are uh, going into foreclosure, losing their jobs, stuff like that. Um, then it, that changes. So yeah. Sorry about that. My, this is real life. My dog's going nuts because uh, somebody just showed up at the house. So, okay. So that, that's, that's my recommendation is look at that feedback loop and see where, like what, why is it not working? So like why your code violation is because you know, these people are in distress, the driving for dollar side of things. You've got this, like, it could be the area that you're driving in. It could be the type of houses that you're looking at. It just, it could be a lot of things. So start thinking about that and then maybe okay. adjust, adjust your routes and try to dial that in to figure out where the distress lives. Cause remember, um, and, and we didn't talk, we didn't spend a lot of time at Flipacking Live on this, but look at supply and demand as a wholesaler. So you got the supply and demand supply is the front end of the business where um, it's where you got to have a distressed seller or distressed property typically in what we do as wholesalers and, and flippers to buy at below market. They're giving up equity for ease and speed of transaction is the way I look at it. So exactly. they know they're giving up equity, but they're getting something in return that they need. So you got to figure out what that avatar looks like, that seller avatar. And then they're all, it also has to line up with the demand in that area. So there has to be somebody who's either flipping houses or buying rentals or doing Airbnbs or building new construction or whatever, mm-hmm. but there has to be investment activity there. So if there's mm-hmm. no investment activity in there, it's not a good place to, to, to mine for leads and, and deals as a wholesaler. If there's not any supply like Brentwood, for example, there's no supply there because everybody knows a realtor and they know they can sell their house for a million dollars. So they're not going to exactly. sell it to you for 450,000. So, exactly. so there's no supply, but there is demand. If we found a deal in there, we could sell it for a lot of money and do a good and, and make money off it. Cause a lot of people want to buy in that area. So you've mm-hmm. got to match up the two to be a really good wholesaler. And that's okay. where you start. Like when you are starting to look at targeting, you should be looking at targeting specifically in markets. I know that's not what you asked, but it mm-hmm. could be a result of why one of your lists isn't working that well. So really that look sense. at that, look at those two things. Okay. And then see, are you targeting the right area for your driving for dollars list? Uh, the code violations, there's, is usually a supply there, right? Cause it's, there's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of, uh, there's distress and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. I like it. Studious and taking notes. <laughs> yes, sir.
Shout out to that. Hey, when I when I found out I was coming on this call, man, I was like, let's go. Awesome. But but yeah, so um as far as so basically you were saying, you know, target those niche lists, basically continue to go after that code violation. Um, you know, find where the weak spots are. Basically, you know, because my drawing for dollars list, um, you know, I have people I'm still following up with, but no one has like really cracked the code or like looking to sell now. Um, well, so, okay. But, so I'm going to jump in there because you said something that's okay. Like okay. if you've got people who are not ready, they're not saying no, they're not saying take me off your list. They're not saying get lost and beat it. They're saying what they're saying to you is not right now. And yeah. what that means is you have to be diligent with your follow-up. A lot of what okay. we do and a lot of our deals come from follow-up. So okay. it, depending on the size of your list and the number of leads that you have, a CRM may be a good step for you because what that does is it creates some tasks and some follow-up things you can, you can build in. Hey, make sure you call this person or you can build in some automation with uh, text messaging and voicemails mm -hmm. and, and emails to the seller and stuff like that because we, we get things back in our database. I mean, we bought a house the other day that we've been following up with them for two and a half years. And so do you think that my competition is following up for two and a half years? Maybe no. not. I mean, you haven't even been in business for two and a half years. So no, I'm like, that's what, that's what separates the professionals from the amateurs. So for me, um, your follow-up game, make sure that it's strong because what a lot of people do is they go out there and they start looking for like the, they want the deal that's going to lay down right away. And yeah. that was, that was my problem when I was new, when I was new, I would, I thought that I, every, every lead when they said no, it was just a no. And I was looking for that really hot, motivated deal. And I think that's why I didn't do a deal for four and a half months. And when my sales rep was hired, what she did was she went back in the database and looked at the cold and warm leads and started calling on them. It had been four or five months since they got in touch with them. So maybe they, I, I use this kind of analogy, like I'm a military guy, so we're always doing first aid and, and uh, dealing with like helicopter crashes and airplane crashes that we think about their training. And it's like, they're just bleeding, right? When we go in there, but it's not that bad. And then it just gets worse and worse over time. And eventually it gets to the point where they're ready. And it might be three mm -hmm. months, it might be six months, it might be nine months, but you want to be there when they're ready. You want to be fresh in their mind. You want to be following up with them. So if you have cold leads, the cold leads are going to warm, move to warm. Warm leads are going to move to hot over time. So what you okay. don't want to do is, I remember when I was new, I had this stack of papers. So I just had like everybody's lead was in a piece of paper on my desk. And mm -hmm. every time I got a new lead, I would just put it back on top. So the people on the bottom of the list, they didn't get the attention that the people on the top did. Usually I would go down like the first five or six uh, leads just happened to be sheets of paper on my desk. And then I'd go, all right, that's all the time I got today. I'll come back tomorrow. And then I would go back to the top and start from the top. And nobody would start would, from the bottom would be getting any love from me because I didn't have a CRM. I didn't have any of that stuff. Mm. So just making sure that you're, you know the last touch for each person and how long it's been, you make sure that you don't go more than a couple weeks, three weeks, for at least a, no, no longer than a month for sure in reaching out okay. to them, whether it's by text message or phone call or, I mean, even, hey, I've been, I was in the neighborhood, just wanted to stop by and say hi. I was been thinking about you and your house, uh, you know, got to chat and what time to chat or something like that. And if you are in the neighborhood, try by that house you went to in the past and knock on the door and say, hey, I just wanted to, you know, say hi and stop by and, and build the rapport. I'll tell you some of the things that we're working on in our company right now, is being more like the small guy, the small company, instead of the big okay. company. Because like right now, we get a call, uh, we have to check the schedule for our reps, our reps then have to just go out there and see it, then they have to make an offer. It's like, it's a process. You get a call right now, we get a call, we, you get a call from a motivated seller on this call right now, you're probably gonna say, hey, I gotta go, you're gonna get in your car, you're gonna <laughs> drive out there, and you're gonna make, you're gonna try to give them an offer, right? Yeah. You're out there that fast. So some of the stuff is building that rapport and stuff like that. See, both of our dogs are going crazy. So yeah. <laughs> like building the rapport um, and, and get, building that relationship. You probably got from Flip Hacking Live. It's, it's about people. It's about relationships. Everything. Exactly. Is, everything mm -hmm. in business is about people. So it making is. sure that they feel like you care about them is going to be the, the, the way that you get a deal over some competition. Mm -hmm. just, like you said, mm -hmm. get rapport with them. And that's crazy because I actually, I went on an appointment yesterday and this is actually, the, the house is in, I would say, it's really outdated. Um, it hasn't been updated. I mean, it's a 1937 house, hasn't been updated since 1937. Um, 
but it's like in a real nice neighborhood, Midtown, where, I mean, some of those houses are going for like 800,000, a million, like right around the corner. It's just a really nice neighborhood. And I went on an appointment with her and I could just tell she wasn't ready to, uh, she's ready to sell, but she wants, she has other investors that she's going on a meeting with. So she wasn't ready to just basically receive the offer yet. So I, I held back. I didn't give her an offer yet. And I was just wondering, like, what it, you were saying, you know, really caring for, for the person is really going to get you over the hump. Um, and I'm just hoping that, you know, because I'm showing I care for her. Uh, I'm basically, you know, laid everything out, educated her a little bit about, you know, uh, what her house is worth. But she, she kind of already knew. Um, but just basically, you know, just really developing rapport and getting to know her. I mean, most of the appointment, we we talked about more about her life than we did about the house, you know? And so um, what, what would be your advice as far as like knowing that there's plenty of other investors involved, there's probably like four or five others involved. What do you think would, what else would give me that edge or is it just building that relationship? I, well, yeah, I think it's building that relationship. Remember people, uh, I, it's, it's about the heart, not the head. Like if you yeah. can, the emotional sale and close is so much stronger than the logical concept in your mind. So mm -hmm. that, like that kind of stuff, like getting in there and then actually caring about them. Like that's the most important thing is like really exactly. listening to their stories. And so what I, what I used to do and I thought I was really good at is I have a, a lot of experience from moving around to different houses. I was in the military. I had moved like when I was going into homes in like 2000, probably like 2014, right around there, 14, 15, uh, where I was going in home, buying houses, started my company, I would just try to relate some of my experiences to them. Like if, if I remind somebody of their grandson or their son or something, then we have some, find common ground. I would always try to find something in common and actually listen, like actively listen. I have, I struggle with that. I know that's one of my huge weaknesses is a lot of people say they're just like waiting for the next time to talk. Yeah. And so I'm a talker. I absolutely am. Mm -hmm. I really like to talk to. and to, to, to understand your weaknesses and really figure out where your strengths are. Like we talked about at the event is strengthening your strengths, but knowing that I struggle listening, I have to, I have to tune out everything. I have to avoid my, I have to have to turn my brain off, avoid thinking about mm -hmm. all the other 10 things that I have going on, my to-do list, um, what's mm -hmm. coming up next and really like look at them. And there was a quote that I heard from a, from a speaker at an event um, that I went to and one of my personal development events that I attended. And he said, um, he said, if you treat somebody like they're the only person in the room, like that's how people want to be treated. They, they, nobody else is around, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your, uh, your, your family, whether it's your friends, like they just want to know that you're there with them. And the people, a lot of, a lot of investors don't understand that. Like they go in there like looking for an outcome and looking for a reason and a way to sell these people as opposed exactly. to just actually just trying to help. I think what exactly. I did really well, and I think you, what you could do really well is go in there as a consultant and really just say, hey, if this isn't the right thing for you, how can I help you get to the next step in your life and like truly care and want to help? And when you come in with that kind of sincerity, if you don't get the deal, it's okay. Because you help somebody, you gave them the opportunity, you gave them that option. When you go in there trying to close someone, you will come out losing. Like even if you get the deal a lot of times, it's just, it's just not the way to do business. And I think a lot of investors lose that in all the sales stuff, all the books that they read, all these things. It's like, let's use some neuro-linguistic programming. Let's figure out yeah. how to do some of this stuff. But um, I'm, I tend more towards the side of like actually trying to genuinely care about people as well as using some of the tips and techniques and tricks that all of us have learned with sales training from all over. So for you, I think the best thing to do is just follow up with her, say, Hey, how did those appointments go? Like what's going on? And in that message, pull something from your conversation yesterday and mm -hmm. say, Hey, you know, you know, I was just thinking about you because of this. And it reminded me of our conversation. I just wanted to check and see how you were doing. Like, is there anything that okay. I can do to help? Um, how did the, how did the uh, conversations go with the other investors? Are you ready for me to come back and, and we'll talk about my offer? You know, however you framed it and left the conversation with her, um, pull back something from what you spoke with her about before and get back in rapport very quickly. And she goes, oh, I can't believe he remembered that. I thought that our conversation meant nothing to him. And, mm -hmm. and really get back into 
Hey, I remember I was listening to you. I remember what we talked about. Um, you know, I do really care about it. So that I okay. find like in the mastermind group that, that, that I run now is that's the most important thing. Like we want to, we want to know that everybody in that group cares about each other. And so we help each other in all ways. But what I've realized is like everybody wants to, to, to have the impact on others and also receive, um, receive value from other people. So if we all need to feel like we're the only person in the room, like we're special, we're, you know, somebody's speaking to you. So if you could do that with her, then at least you know that you had the opportunity. And if it really yeah. is about who she works with and, and why, then you'll win. If it's about money mm -hmm. and you aren't the highest offer, you'll lose. And you're probably mm -hmm. going to lose in that case anyway. But yeah. um, it's definitely kind of a way to go. It's the way that I like to go. It's the way that a lot of my sales reps go in the direction of like, we want to care about we want to care about the people in the community. We want to make the houses better. We want to do right by them, do what we say we're going to do. And if we do that, then we've won, whether we get the deal or not, like money, money flows to those kind of people. Exactly. So exactly. Just like Walter, Walter, Walter Bond said, right? It's currency that's meant to flow. It'll flow to you when yes, you put sir. out that kind of stuff. So you were going to say no. something? Um, it's funny cause you pointed it out, you know, if she would want, you know, if it depends on who she works with or, um, how much she wants What's what's funny is I actually, she actually pointed out something towards the end. She was like, you know, she was like, I kind of don't care, you know, who it is that I work with. Um, she was just basically saying, you know, she's testing to basically see how much she's going to get. Yeah. So she's shopping, right? So she's, yeah. she's playing the bidding game. And when that, when that, when I hear that, when that stuff starts coming out, then now it's about, okay, this is, is this just about the money? And then maybe the next question, the follow-up question is that is, so, so you don't care who it is that you do business with. It's just all about the money for you. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of see what she responds to that. And if she's like, yeah, I just, it's the highest bidder here. Okay. So if, if the, if somebody comes in, who's just, you know, Gonna tie, you're gonna tie up your 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 house for a while. Go through multiple inspection periods. Reduce the price because they gave you a really high price, and they're gonna come back and renegotiate with you. That's okay with you. And just kind of go go down that path a little bit, and just explore it, and just say uh, say okay, well, you know, I, let me just tell you how we do business. And you know, mm -hmm. I I want to be upfront and honest. I really care about the people that I work with. Um, I want to make sure that they get the best price, but they also get the best service. So, you know, um, my price might not be as high as everybody else's, but I do, I know that when, I, when you work with me that we're going to get it done. We're going to do those. If you know, you can do that. Right. So yeah. um, like we know, I know that when we go into these houses that we're, pro we're either buying them or we'll wholesale them and we can get them done. And if not, we're going to buy them. So it's at a point where we can say some things like that, where, you know, uh, you know, and we can point back to our reviews and our testimonials and stuff like that and say, we really care about the people that we work with. So, um, and you know, it's a shame that it's just all about money because, uh, but if that's the case, then I'll make you the best offer that I can. And, if it works for you, great. And if not, then um, maybe you call me if it doesn't work out with the other person. So that's, that's okay. kind of the way that I go with that, that side of things. And it mm -hmm. may not be like the perfect sales call or anything like that, but I yeah. really just want to take care of people and, and we care about them and we want to do right by them. So yeah, definitely. And, and when somebody brings up the auction kind of stuff, that's, that's usually where we'll kind of like hold our offer and do some of that stuff. And if they just care about the money, it's the highest offer, then fine. Like, let me be the last one to come in and see if I can beat the highest offer. And if I can't, I'll tell you, I can't. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. That's yep. my strategy. So, right so the, well, that, that's a good strategy, but what you have to be careful of is that somebody doesn't come in with the number that she wants that yeah. you may be able to beat. And she doesn't give you the opportunity to do it. So that's why you want to check back with her on a somewhat regular basis, stay in front of her and just say, Hey, yeah. you know, I was, you know, thinking about you last night uh, or today. And I just wanted to just wonder how everything went. Um, I'm ready to make my offer when you're ready um, or something like that. Or, you know, Hey, when can we get back together to talk about this? And that way you'll find out. She might say like, Oh, Hey, somebody came and gave me the number that I wanted. So hopefully you got the number that she wanted. You know what it is. Yeah, I did. Okay, good. I did. So, and if you can't pay that, then you, you are slow playing it, which I, I think is good. So, um, so I think you're, you're in good shape then, but keep kind of checking back with her. So. Okay. I also had a question. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of cold calling and I'm pretty sure you would know there's a lot of dud numbers and some people you just cannot get a hold of. And so I put them on an extremely high number of a, a big, list of um people that i have to door knock um what do you think about 
door knocking and you think it's something that maybe I should add to my business, like maybe cold calling like in the mornings, you know, from from nine to one and then maybe door knocking later on in the day. What, what do you think about that? So I'm going to give you a couple different options here. If you have a big list to door knock, it might not be the best use of your time. Like if it's a, okay. just a huge list from if it's but if it's like a 200. But, but your cold calling stuff is, um, is niche stuff, right? You're talking about, yeah. you're talking about like code violation type houses, right? Yeah. So I think it might, it might be, uh, I, what, I, what I would do is I would sort them. So I'd put them in Excel sheet and I'd sort them by zip code. And, okay. then, and then what I would do is I would use the thing that you did before, the formula we talked about where you have supply and demand. And if it's a really good, and, and I've got some videos. So in that, in that flip hacking Facebook group that we have, if you're, if you're not in there, jump in there because I, create, I put a list source video in there about um, using list source for free to find out where the, um, the buyers and sellers, the supply and demand is. So you can, mm. you can find that stuff for free without spending a dime in your market, in your okay. city, in your, your county. So what you can see is you, over the last year, you can see where the cash transactions were or where the investor type property purchases were. And then mm -hmm. you, so you can take that and say, this zip code is super hot for wholesale deals. So okay. it, what, I, what I teach a lot of people when they don't have a lot of money is go to those zip codes first, like go own that zip code first. And then as you make some more money, you can start going into the other zip codes out of there. So where's the okay. demand really high where there is supply in there? There's the uh, distressed sellers or, or houses. And then go, okay. start there. Like if you only have enough money, to, and usually it's, it's in the direct mail teaching that I do is start in those mm -hmm. top two or three uh, zip codes and spend like just blanket those areas and then start going down from there. So, okay. So I would say that like you can sort by the zip codes so you can see maybe you start with an area that is really hot for wholesale deals and you wouldn't go door knock in the Brentwood neighborhood, right? You go door knock in the neighborhood that you might not want to be door knocking in. So that's another thing to think about. Yeah. So um, pick an area that you're comfortable in and stuff like that. But the other answer to that question is, so I wouldn't necessarily go out and do all 200 unless it makes like you start seeing some progress, seeing some deals. Um, okay. Cause that's a little bit different conversation, right? You're knocking on some yeah. door and it's like, Hey, your house looks like crap. Can I buy it? You gotta, yeah, you, gotta exactly. you gotta work that script a little bit. Right. So, yeah. but what, what I would do then also is, um, is the, the door knocking side of things is you're doing something that nobody else is willing to do. Mm -hmm. And when you are willing to do what others are not willing to do and getting in the uncomfortable space, that's where money lives. It mm -hmm. lives in the area where every people talk about door knocks. Like I'm not going to door knock. You're not going to door knock because you you don't want to. You're going to get shot down. You're going to get you're you're going to they're, they're going to tell you to get off their doorstep. You're going to feel uncomfortable. So it's yeah. a little bit different sales strategy. You need to be feel like look very unthreatening. The script, the conversation is a little bit different from the beginning. You want to quickly yeah. build some rapport. You probably want to do some more like, like, uh, like, uh, mirror, like body language mirroring and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. like step, step back from the, step back from the door and come away. So they don't feel that you're really threatening. And, but that's the stuff that people aren't willing to do. And when, yeah. you're, when you're living in that world, then that's where deals and money live because we're not doing that. I'll tell you right now, my yeah. not doing that. The big companies aren't doing that. People in our mastermind group aren't doing that because mm -hmm. they are, they live in the, I have money. So I'm going to go spend money to find leads area. You live yeah. in the, I don't have money, but I have time area. And when you live there, that's, and, and those people are like networking and maybe cold calling, driving for dollars, sending mail pieces. They're not necessarily knocking on doors either. So that is like the, the peak of the peak for like low competition. Okay. So I, I would highly recommend it. Um, I, and, but watch your, watch your time spent, the fruit that it's bearing, those kind of things. So track your numbers, same thing. I went and knocked okay. on 20 doors today. I didn't talk to anybody. I got no leads. You do that every day. And then it takes five hours, let's say. And then you spend five hours cold calling. I got 15 leads. I got two appointments. And uh, you know, I, I think I have a potential deal in there. Then can I spend double of my time cold calling instead of door knocking and will it bear yeah. more fruit or am I maxed out at those hours of the day? So now I'm going to go door knock. So just watching, watching your, um, like the, your time in your return on time and your return on investment as far as money goes, that's what you need to watch. Okay. Okay. And, and just by what you were saying, you know, goes to the hot zip codes. I actually have one in mind. Um, and I know exactly where I want to go. And I'm going to go on that list source and do that. But cool. I have one right in mind. And I have plenty of leads in that. 
in that area. So it's perfect. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think of it like the, it's the, I, I look at all the marketing that I do in my, my world as like a, uh, like a lake, right? And there's fish yeah. all around the lake. Well, that one zip code that you're talking about is like the honey hole that has like 25% of the deals in my zip code. There's, there's areas in some of our cities that produce about 50% of our income, just one zip code. Wow. Produce 50% of the revenue for the company. So, wow. and some of those were zip codes that I never wanted to go into when I was first mm. getting started. So knowing where the supply and demand is and what, your, what the marketplace looks like is so important in this business, whether you're a flipper or a wholesaler, this goes for either one. So knowing like some people will say, I'm not going to go flip over there because there's so many flippers over there. They're, they're flipping a ton of houses. I'm going to go to this other area where flippers aren't flipping. They're not flipping yeah. over there for a reason. Like you don't need to go over there and create your exactly. own model, your own flipping model. Go, go flip where everybody's like tons of people are doing deals over there because there's a lot of available deals. There's a lot of buyers. There's a lot of inventory. There's all that stuff. Like just think about it. Like why is that happening instead of uh, uh, going, going against the grain, right? So. Okay. Okay. Sounds like a plan. How many more questions you got? Um, let me see. <laughs> I'm going to page three, page four. Good. Oh, actually I didn't have any other questions. That's it. That's all you got. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was it. I was actually cold calling right before, right before oh, yeah? we had done this. So I was just, I was just focusing on some leads before doing that, but as far as, um, okay, let's talk, let's talk about more about follow-up because I think okay. this is something that is really critical and I've heard it um, a lot and I just heard it from you as far as like the follow-up you were saying basically, you know, so, so let's say I have a lead that's gone cold. Let's say like they're saying, Hey, I'm ready to sell. Like I want to sell, but like you start calling them, texting them and they just disappear. And then out of nowhere, they hit you back up and say, yeah, I'm looking to sell, but then just continue to, you know, disappear and just. Yeah. So how to revive yeah. somebody who's not responding to you, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so what I do is I think about what the, what the relationship and conversations were in the past. So can I use some of that to revive that conversation? So can I, mm -hmm. can I bring something else in? And then, um, Probably the next best thing to do is something where it's, it's an empathetic uh, um, like question to them. So I think, I think, there's, I think uh, Chris Voss talks about it and Never Split the Difference, where he's got like this perfect email or something, where it's like, have you given up on this? With a question mark. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember that? So, yeah, I do remember that. So I absolutely, I think, it, I think it's from that book. So uh, I saw it on your shelf. So, um, yeah. so it, it might just be like, have you given up on on, on the deal or on selling your house, something like that with a question mark. Okay. And a lot of times what you can do in a, t you put that in a text message and send it. What, what people don't respond to a lot of times is like, uh, co constant phone calls and text messages. What usually happens there is they just get more annoyed with you. And then it's like, I, I can't, I can't even answer this guy's call now because I've missed the last 15 that he's tried to call me. You know, yeah. I, t I take it. I try to put myself in their shoes when, whenever somebody calls, let's say, Let's say you called me, right? And I say, mm -hmm. I said, Dante, uh, let me, I'll call you back tomorrow. I just, I don't have time to talk right now. I'm going to have to call you back tomorrow. And like a week goes by, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, oh crap, I forgot to call Dante back. And I feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable because I told you I'd call you the next day. And for me, the way that I work and I operate, I don't really like to talk on the phone. So yeah. I actually, I actually hate it personally. So, but, <laughs> but then I get to the point where I'm like, man, can I even call him and or is he going to be upset that I didn't call him the next day? I said I would. And then another two days goes by. I, I kind of kick the can down the road. And now I'm like, I definitely can't call him back. It's been a two weeks. And now it's been mm -hmm. three weeks. And now I am just actually going to avoid him because I feel horrible about it. And instead, yeah. of, instead of me just calling you and saying, hey, man, sorry, I didn't call, uh, call you back that day. I got really busy. All this stuff happened. Here, excuse after excuse. So I feel like when we beat the sellers up, when we like text them and email them and ringless voicemail them and, and hit them with all that stuff. And they're not responding when they were very responsive in the beginning, something has happened probably either they're mm -hmm. decided not to sell and they just don't want to tell you, or they sold to somebody else uh -huh. and they don't want to tell you they, um, they are under contract with some, uh, it, like a lot of different things could happen. So what you want to do is just kind of like knock their guard down a little bit, get something that's not aggressive that they, they will respond to. It's not like, Hey, this is Dante again. Uh, can you please call me back? Uh, I still haven't heard from you. It's been a week. 
okay, it's been yeah. two weeks. Like we, I thought we were going to do this deal. What's happening. And instead just something like something that elicits a response. Like it could be anything, not real aggressive, just something that's nice and easy. It could be, it could start with like, like we talked about that Chris Foss email via text message or an email. If I've sent an email, um, maybe it's in a subject line, like, Hey, have you given up on this deal or something like that? That's it. Leave it at that. See if they respond. If they don't, you could like respond to that and just say, Hey, just following up. It's okay. If you know, things happen. I, it takes me forever to respond to people or, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've been super busy lately. It's my fault. I'm sorry. You know, and where it's more of an empathetic thing where they feel some, okay. some reason to reciprocate on that, but you mm-hmm. just want to elicit a response somehow. And even if it's like, okay. even if it's a no, if it's a yes, whatever it is, um, just get them to say something and then you'll start a conversation. And it could, a lot of times, I might go back to a conversation that we had. I'll look at my notes. I'll look in the CRM and it's like, Hey, you know, you were talking about this. Maybe you got busy because it was so-and-so's birthday, or I know that the holidays are coming up and you're probably really busy. That's okay. Could you just, um, just let me know if you're still interested in selling. It's okay. If you're not, just tell me, you know, something like that where you're just kind of trying to get a response where it's in a non-threatening manner where they don't feel like you're like calling and leaving voicemails, texting, emailing, all that stuff, and just blasting them all the time with the same message, right? Like, this is Dante. Mm-hmm. I'm calling about your house again. I thought we were going to do the deal. I don't know what happened. Call me back at this number. Um, I don't know what your voicemails are like or your text message or if you're leaving them or anything, but just go, go at them with a non-threatening um, answer. If I can find a way to see that they've read it, that helps. So a lot of email services... Yeah. Um, read receipts or things that you can see that somebody's opened it and read it. So I hate to like let mm-hmm. the cat out of the bag, but um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of email services that when you open an email, it shows that this person has read your email. So at least then I know that they've seen it and they're choosing yeah. not to respond to me now. A text message okay. doesn't show me that unless they have read receipts. Um, Facebook yeah. messages, you can see if somebody read a Facebook message. So if I can find them on Facebook, I might consider doing something like that. So just a way to give me some sort of feedback. You just want feedback because the uncertainty is horrible. It might be something, maybe that's somewhere where you just go in the neighborhood, knock on their door and say, hey, I was in the neighborhood, haven't heard from you, brought you something, um, just wanted to stop mm-hmm. by and bring you this thank you note for giving me the opportunity to buy the house. You know, something like that. Okay. Where, yeah, hey, that's actually. reason to stop by or something that you talked about in the past where, hey, I know, I know it doesn't seem like we're doing a deal, but here's a, here's a $5 Starbucks gift card because I know you said you like coffee uh, on, our, on our appointment, you know? And um, if you ever know anybody else in the area, I'd be happy to pay you for, uh, for a referral or something like that, you know? So any way to get, to get back in front of them because it was a yeah, deal. Anyway. The worst part, I remember this from when I was going in houses all the time. The worst part is thinking that you're going to get a yes and it's a deal and then they just go dark and silent. And I would yeah. rather know that they didn't or why they didn't or what's happening than just not knowing. Like, just tell me that you sold to somebody else. Yeah, tell, that's tell how me, I feel. Tell me, that, <laughs> tell me that you hate the way I look. Tell me you hate the car Man. I drive. Like, just, just tell me. Just don't yeah. leave me hanging. So. Same thing with me. Same yeah, but what me. happens as investors, what we do is after a, a few weeks of follow-up, we just quit. We mm-hmm. say, oh, you know what? Hey, this is, they're, they're obviously not interested, but that might not be the case. Like, this guy might be in the hospital. He might have something, yeah. serious, like something may have happened. You could even send a message yeah. like, Oh my gosh, I haven't heard from you in two weeks. Is something wrong? Like I'm legitimately worried about you. Do you mm-hmm. need something? Like I haven't heard from you. Are you okay? Like you can, you can say something like that. Just get creative and just okay. figure out something to, to elicit a response. Um, and okay. you're in the cold calling game. So you do some skip tracing and stuff like that. Maybe skip trace a relative and send, send them a message and say, hey, I haven't heard from Johnny in like three weeks. We were talking about doing a deal with him on his house. I'm actually really worried about him. Have you heard from him? Like, okay. if bigger, dude, there's get creative. There's Just so many away. ways in this business. Just find a way. Yeah, okay. to, to get a response, especially if it was going to be a really good deal. You're wondering what's going on. Obviously, yeah. before I get crazy creative like that, I might go to the... Um, uh, to like the county assessor's website and see if he sold the house already, you know? Mm. Uh, so we do okay. that. We'll scrub our database to see if people sold their house and kind of remove them from our uh, list and stuff. So, Okay. Okay. And I actually did have a couple more questions. I All right. Come on, on, hit me. Sheet. So when someone says no, because, you know, I get a lot of no's, but you know they're in a distressed situation. Like, you know that their house is just torn up. You know that they have a bunch of coal violation. You know that their property is vacant. Uh, what what do you do with those notes? Is this is it the same process? Do you just dump them? Never 
never talk to them again or do you so continue? is it a no is it a no or is it like a not right now it's like a no no i'm okay. not looking this not never ever i'm never gonna sell but like just a no i'm not yeah so i put i just would put them on a long-term follow-up and check okay. back and, and even in that conversation, it might be, um, well, do you think that you could see anything ha that, that could come up over the next year, two years, that, or six months, or anything that happened that would actually make you need to sell? Is it okay if I follow up with you? Or, okay. and, and maybe not even asking that question, maybe something more like, um, I, just, I, I, would feel, I would feel good following up with you just to check in every now and then just to see if something's changed. Um, okay. yeah, no, no problem. That sounds, that's fine. I actually really enjoyed talking to you. So... Um, no problem. Yeah. Check up, call, call whenever, you know, or they're like okay. the, the people that we remove from our list for good are only the people who are like threatening harm to my staff. They're yeah. wanting to come to our office and like, like lay a bomb in there for everybody. Like the people who are really aggressive or threatening to, uh, you know, give us bad reviews or like one star on better business bureau, stuff like that. Like, uh, okay. everybody else is, they're never a no unless they like fully sell their house or, they tell us like they're going to harm us. <laughs> so okay. we try to keep everybody in follow up if we can. I wouldn't, I wouldn't drop anybody from the list, but I would spend okay. my attention different. Like if you're a one man show, I would work yeah. on where I'm spending my time and attention and try to automate okay. some of the other stuff. Okay. 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 And then um, another question. So when do you think would be a good time for me to start thinking about, like, I know, Definitely not right now, but when do you think would be a good time for me to start expanding and start, um, you know, delegating responsibilities? So I would say, I, I, usually my answer to that is if you're asking, it's probably the right time, but you are also coming off Flip Hacking Live where you saw a lot of people that had some, you saw my staff there, you saw people that had teams and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you you got to get to a point where you're comfortable. What I would say is, it's somewhere where you're holding yourself and your company back. Like okay. you don't have enough time. You don't have enough resources. You can't give enough to the growth of this journey that you need to start hiring somebody and, and not, not wait till you're maxed out and at capacity and, and you're consistently doing deals. So you want to hire a little bit ahead of when you're ready but not to the point where it starts stressing you out financially and maxing you out. Um, I would build that first staff member into your six month runway. So okay. let's say you do two more deals, you build up some money and now you're saying, okay, I'd really like to outsource this, like something. Mm -hmm. And then what I would do is say, okay, can I build this person's salary into the next six months along with my marketing budget and operational budget and overhead and everything like that? And then that gives us the opportunity to start working together for those six months where I feel like I'm actually committing to this person longer than just like one month of salary, right? So okay. that, that would be, um, that just wouldn't be fair for that person coming in. So yeah, that's my recommendation. Um, I wouldn't wait too, too long. And I would also get some advice from some other people along the way, like um, okay. you know, reach out to, to some of the people that you've met, continue to ask these questions, like follow some of the people that are, that are close to size and, and kind of their, your journey and stuff like that. Um, but I think yeah, you know that you're not ready right now, but what I would say is at, like you do two or three more deals and then, mm -hmm. You got to start figuring out like as you want to grow a little bit like what what are you not good at and, like we like we did that, that we did that exercise at Flipback yeah. Live what are you not good mm -hmm. at and what don't you like to do and then can you bring mm -hmm. somebody in to fill that kind of stuff up because if you can then that's the route to go and bring somebody in that likes to do that stuff and is really good at it so you can focus okay. on the areas that you're really strong so I'd look at I'd look at kind of the money but realize you don't need the money to pay for their like their salary for a year and a half. So yeah. could, otherwise that's what, that's what a lot of entrepreneurs and growing companies struggle with is they wait mm -hmm. too long to bring somebody in. Um, and you also don't want to bring them in too, too early where you don't have enough runway. And after a month you have to let them go because you need to, yeah. like, you need to hit uh, like a bunch of deals right away. So that's what I tell people that are joining the mastermind group is like, do you, if you're going to, you're going to come in on a monthly payment plan on, do you have to need to get a deal inside the first or second month to continue to make that monthly payment plan for the year? Because mm -hmm. I see that a lot. People are like, oh, this is a get rich quick, quick thing. You're going to, we're going to join this mastermind group. We're going to jump in there and these guys are going to like get deals for us in the first month. And I know that we're going to close three deals. We'll make $50,000 and we can pay this thing off. Like, 
Mm-hmm. That's not realistic, right? And yeah. I, I'm definitely not selling that kind of idea to anybody. Yeah. I want somebody who's comfortable where they are. This They can see that this is the stepping stone for the next level of their business, the next step, the next kind of growth of their company. And they, they say, okay, I'm, I'm going to commit for a year. Like people that come into our group, they need to commit for a year. So for you, I would say commit to that person for about six months that you, you feel comfortable, that you have the deal flow okay. to be able to uh, consistently do some deals and, and continue to grow. And not wait too long where you're maxed out. And because then what you do is you're going to bring that person on and you're going to have to train them. And so to train them, you're going to have to take two steps back to take steps forward. So Mm -hmm. while you're training them, you're going to have to drop a lot of your responsibilities that you were doing before. So if you're completely maxed out, you can't effectively bring somebody in and get them up to speed while still doing what you were doing before. Okay. Okay. Nice. Nice. So basically, you know, I just need to, to, you know, build up a little bit more money, have a six month runway and basically knowing that I can build, build their income into my lifestyle basically. Yeah. Or into that six months plan. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's a, it's a big step to take on that responsibility of somebody else. Yeah. Right. So you're looking at it like you're mentoring somebody, you're bringing them in. Um, They're coming on board uh, with you. And so that was a responsibility that I took very seriously. And I had that kind of money set aside, but I didn't know if it was going to be two or three, like, I didn't know when we were going to, I had a six month runway with my first hire Didi and Mm -hmm. I had the money set aside. But after four and a half months, I was starting to get like, I was worried, you know, it was, Mm -hmm. uh, it was going to be, I was like, oh, can I keep her on for another month and a half? I got to get a deal here. And then we got that first deal, yeah. 10,000. And then we got another deal for 10,000. And then it started to grow from there. And, and then we did like okay. two deals and then five deals a month. And we were rolling then. Then we could hire some more people. So um, it was kind of like you want to you want to grow that, that, that side of the business organically. You want to organically okay. be able to add more people in. And that's the way to do it. Okay. You, Dante, you remind me a lot of my cousin. I have a cousin who's at uh, UT um, here in Tennessee, and he is very serious. He came to Flip Hacking Live. He's uh, yeah. he's eighteen actually. Um, but oh he, wow! He he thinks like uh, like he's an old soul. I say about him, mm-hmm. like he really is driven. He's focused. He's he, he's amazing kid. His name's uh, Joey, Joey Torino. Joey, so uh, Joey he, Torino. he came to the event. He, he came because Jocko was, came. And Jocko, he's, yeah. yeah, he wants to be a Navy SEAL. He's like totally focused. He is, um, he's just a really, really awesome kid. And he's going to make it. He's going yeah. he's, he's to show this world. He's not going to quit. He's, he's going to grow. He's going uh, he's gonna to do something amazing in this world. And I can, like the way that you talk, the way that you ask questions, he's, he's very, he's, He's written things down. He actually wrote me, <laughs> maybe I'll read this. He wrote me a note after Flip Hacking Live. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, just his experience and like his thanks and stuff like that is really, really cool. So you remind me a lot of him, like your, the way that you talk and you're, you seem to be very systematic and methodical in like preparing for this and a, a, asking questions. He had, um, he had a, uh, in his Flip Hacking Live notebook, he had 10 questions written out for Jocko that he, cause he was wow. backstage with me and Jocko. So he, he came, I, I invited him back cause he wanted to meet him. Um, and he read these 10 questions to him. And they were talking for like 45 minutes. So oh I, I went, I went on stage. I came off stage. They're still talking. Uh, I, I was preparing for things. It was just this, it was during like lunch and all, they were still mm-hmm. talking. He, he hammered awesome. him with questions. So, Hey, let me, let me read this is, I think it's, that's I think awesome. it's pretty cool because I, and I think, I think Joey will get a ton out of this if he listens. So, um, so he said, um, I can't express enough how grateful I am to have experienced Flip Hacking Live. I was skeptical about missing, missing school to attend an event in which I would feel inferior to other highly educated individuals in regard to real estate investing. However, I'll never forget you telling me that you always want to be the dumbest guy in the room. Plus, I knew I'd get to see Jocko if nothing else. It was phenomenal to see so many people see you in some light they're the same light as I've seen you since I was a small kid. You truly are one of the greatest role models and mentors. And it was an honor, my honor to come out to San Diego and witness your success and the legacy you're leaving. Uh, it was also nice to see the Holy Spirit working through you in regard to how many lives you're changing in the process of owning your own company and taking up another responsibility as the CEO of the Mastermind Group. Uh, you fill the role of God's servant in more ways than one. 
And I like to think that I planted the seed by inviting you to come to Church of the City. Uh, I can't thank you enough for putting me face to face with Jocko. It was an amazing experience I'll never forget. And I'll reflect on it one day as a Navy SEAL. Uh, lastly, I'm so uh, darn proud of you. Um, you've taught me more than I have enough paper or ink to explain. You never cease to challenge my mindset and the limitations I put on myself. You exemplify what it means to be a good dad, husband, boss, son, brother, cousin, friend, servant, and so much more. I'll always look up to you and wow. your wisdom. I'm proud to call you my friend. I'm proud to call you my family. Most of all, I'm proud to call you my role model and mentor. Hold the line and never tire of doing what is right. Rely always on God, onward and upward. Love your grateful mentee, Joey. So, like, amazing to He's get that, He's going right? somewhere. He's going Not somewhere, 18 man. years old. Freshman yeah. at UT, he's asking me to like figure out how to has, house hack uh, next year at a sophomore year in college. Can I buy a house and he can manage it? And, and I'm like, yeah, hey man, I am in. Like, can you imagine? Like, I couldn't even write like that when I was probably I until either. like a year ago. And so, like, that's that is so cool to see. And um, it's just kind of amazing to see what you guys like. And I, I, I'll lump you in with him, 18, 22 years old, 25. Like a lot of times in, in our, our world right now in, in, in the States here, we think that mm-hmm. the, the younger generation, the people that are coming up, and I'm almost 40, so I think I can say that you're the younger generation to me. Um, we got yeah. about 18 years apart. And so, um, but it's amazing to see what some of these leaders and, and visionaries and entrepreneurs are doing and will continue mm-hmm. to do. So a lot of times people complain about, the, the younger generation not pulling their weight, not thinking big, playing video games. But I mean, I look yeah. at this picture of you on Facebook and see these books and what you're reading and, the, and what you're filling your body with and your mind and, and how you're driving yourself is just amazing to see. So I'm super proud of you and I'm incredibly proud of my cousin Joey because I gave him Rich Dad, Poor Dad when he was like like 12 years old to read, 10, wow. maybe 10 years old to read. And then he's every book that I've given him, every book on your shelf, uh, I, I think I've given him to read. Um, definitely wow. the billionaire next door was the next one I gave him after rich dad, poor dad, when he understood assets and liabilities. And then I just kept giving him things and giving him things. And, um, you know, I, I hear uh, there's, there's a uh, man, I, I don't know who said it, but like success leaves clues is one of my favorite quotes, um, that this, this young man is going somewhere. You're going somewhere with the questions that you asked today, with the direction that you're going, like you guys will not be stopped. And whatever it is, like the biggest thing that I can give you at the end of this is just don't waste it. Like don't, you're going to, there's going to be a point. It's just like my opening when I talked about my why and everything that was going on in my life and mm-hmm. things like there's going to be times where it's hard and it seems hard and you're struggling and it's taking time to get your deals and you're hitting a brick wall and just push through that. Like, go past that and, and find something inside of you of what's driving you. Because if it's not strong enough, you'll quit or you'll turn around or you'll go do something else. Like I wish that I was 22 years old having this conversation right now. And these tables were turned (laughs) because like you have, you have realized something way before a lot of people you've kind of, it seems like you found your calling, you found what you want to do. Nothing's going to stop you. And so just continue to like thirst for knowledge and continue to take the action that you're taking. Like this massive action, this nonstop thing, you just go and go and go. I see my cousin do the same thing. Like he just awesome. can't stop him. This, this kid just, he was like this like chubby little 12 or 14 year old when I remember him. And now he's this mm-hmm. like big dude, bigger than me can, uh, he's running circles around me in the gym. He's, he, he said, <laughs> He said that he feels like he has a part of it because he did. He took, he brought me back to the church when I didn't want to go, when I was in a bad place with my son, uh, James was about to be born. He brought me to the church mm-hmm. It changed a lot of things for me, um, a wow. different mindset for me, a different like gratitude, appreciation, everything, living every day like it's my last day and really kind of putting it all out there all the time. He, he helped me with that. And he was, he was 15 at that time. So wow. a 15 year old. And I was 36, I was 36, he was 15. And he, uh, he took me to the right place at the right time where I needed and wow. guided me there. So I'm getting, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. I didn't expect to go down this road here, but um, you remind me a lot of him and I know that you'll be successful and um, I'm really excited to see kind of your journey and what you do. So hopefully we stay in touch. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah. and Definitely. And, uh, hopefully you listen to the podcast and, from here on out yeah. and, and hang out. And, um, if there's anything that you need, like I, I'd love to, I'd love to help or see how I can help. I, I want to continue to put out uh, great kind of free content on the podcast, get yeah. you 
need to be. Um, bring you back to Flip Hacking Live next year, and yeah, definitely, uh, you'll be definitely. killing it next year. Jump into the group yes, and we'll figure out how to yes. get you oh, to yeah, the next definitely. level. So, hey, um, I was just about to tell you about that. Hey, I'm I'm joining the group next year for sure. Awesome, I'm joining the group. I'll have the funds ready. Um, nice. I'm just can't wait, man. Can't wait because I the one thing that I love about your podcast, your your seminar is just you're real authentic. You're you're real. You know, and I sense that from the start because like most people, you know, there's like, hey, you can get rich doing this, get rich doing that. But like I can see like the authenticity in which you present, in which you talk. And like I can tell you generally want to help people. And and I am attracted to that. I love that. And that's why I do want to be a part of the tribe. And I I'm just extremely thankful to to be on this call and and talk to someone like you. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate that. I think that's, that was my mission going into this from the start is I'm not a, uh, I'm not a real flashy guy. Uh, I almost told the story of my dad at the event because I was talking about him and he, he still gets his jeans and pants from Walmart and stuff like, like wow. just millionaire, millionaire next door kind of guy. And mm. that's kind of what was instilled in me. And, um, that's how, that's how you get there. Like you, you save, you, you, you be smart with your money, you work hard and, and uh, you, you make the right decision. So um, I appreciate that. I really do. I, I love the fact that, um, that you say that and seeing that at the event. And that's, that was my whole job at that event. And my whole goal was to just show everybody the real side of each and every one of us that were up on stage, not be fake, not, not hide anything, not um, be somebody that we're not. Um, the only thing that's different about me in real life is I don't wear those kind of clothes. Like yeah. <laughs> I don't wear suits too often. It's like once a year at Flip Backing Live, I'll put on a suit a couple times with no tie. Um, but every year I have to get them tailored and buy a new one because I only have two. So if I wear the same two from last year, everybody will know. So um, <laughs> that's kind of the difference. But it's, I'm not really a suit guy. I'm not a flashy guy. Um, you know, yeah. I, every car that I've owned for the past 10 years has been gray. So it's just oh, wow. the, the kind of things that I have. So Dante, I appreciate you being with me. And man, I had so, I had so much fun. I'll tell you what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just uh, uh, give you a ticket to Flip Backing Live next year. So I don't know if yeah. I'm assuming. Uh, so I'm just, I'm going to have the team make sure that you're on uh, on our VIP list for next year and just kind of awesome. give you a ticket so you can come and, and we'll make sure of that. Awesome. So I had a good time today and, uh, and I look forward to seeing your success. So keep, keep me, awesome. keep in touch. Make sure you yeah. tell me how you're doing. And, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll kind of share with, uh, with the community of, uh, of where you're going. So I had awesome. a lot of fun, man. I'm, I'm excited to see where you too. go. 22 year old Dante, let's see where you are at 23. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm yeah. ready, man. I'm just, I'm just ready to get back going to hop on the calls and just get some more deals and, and provide value to the marketplace, man. Awesome. Just, it's incredibly motivating. So if you guys are, uh, you know, I, this is awesome. I, I'm, I'm so excited for you. So, all right. Hey, I had fun and, um, I'll, uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll see you on the podcast. And if I don't talk to you before next year, hopefully you sh send me some updates, but I'll see you at Flip Packing Live next year for sure. Yeah. One more thing uh, too. Yeah. I wanted to let you know that one day I want to speak on the stage. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, I want to speak on the stage. All yeah. right. Well, that's etched in stone now. I know I, have to, I know I have to get somewhere. I just, I just wanted to point that out right here. So I'm, I'm held accountable as well. All right. So, so but when, like, that's, that's a, that's like a dream, right? Uh -huh. We got it. We got to come up with a date to turn mm -hmm. that dream let's, into a goal. Right. So, okay. Oh, so let's do two years from now, two years from now, you're going to be speaking yeah. on stage at Flip Packing Live. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Two you years from here. now, I'll be speaking on stage. You heard it here. Flip live. I love it. Hey, there's a lot of people that came up to me and said that at the end of the event. So I'm going to yeah. hold you to it. All right. It's I in. Will be we got it. Day. I love it. I love I it. I, hey, I don't doubt it. I think if you keep on this clip, you keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, Sacramento is not an easy, easy market to be in. You know, that's a, it's, not, it's, not a, a, it's competitive. Not Every market is competitive. The people who say mm -hmm. that, Oh, this is easy. This is hard. It's look, um, we're, but you, you, you are not held back by that, which I love. You're like, bring it on, you know, let's deals do everywhere. It. I love it. I love deals it. Everywhere. Uh, okay. That's awesome. All right, Dante. I had fun today, that's man. All All right. Right. I have fun too. Bill, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Seven Figure Flipping Podcast with Bill Allen. If you want to grow and scale your house flipping or wholesaling business, check out more insider tips and strategies from the nation's most successful real estate investors at sevenfigureflipping.com.